welcome to the Metal Magdalene with Jet right here on Metal Messiah Radio. Tonight we have a special guest on the show with us. We have Mike Browning of Nocturnus AD. Welcome back to the show, Mike. All right, Jet. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Okay, Mike. So let's get some history on yourself leading into Nocturnus. Now, a lot of people don't know that you are one of the co-founders of Morbid Angel. So just tell us all about that. Oh, well, that actually goes way, way back. Um, I met Trey in high school. I was in my last year of high school, and I graduated uh, uh, class of 82. So uh, I met Trey in 1981, and I, he was like a year younger than me. Uh, and uh, he came, I remember he came into the school year like halfway through or something like that. He wasn't there since the beginning. And, and I met him. There was a place that, uh, like, everybody that, like, smoke cigarettes or whatever, you know, it was like kind of the cool rock and roll people and stuff like that, and metal was just starting, you know, too, with some bands like, you know, Geo and Sabbath and stuff like that, but um, but there's a place on the side of the high school where everybody hung out, and you know, the people who smoked cigarettes were there, and, you know, so I met Trey there, and he had long hair, and I had kind of long hair, and really not too many people still had long hair, it was weird in high school uh, that year, but, you know, some people did, but we started talking, and you know, we both knew about, you know, metal bands and stuff like that, and we both were started talking to each other about, you know, the, the Satanic Bible and Necronomicon, and we, it seemed like we knew everything the same, you know? So I was talking to him, and, you know, he invited me over to his house, which he lived real close to the high school, and I lived real close to the high school. So, I mean, I think I was 17, and he was 16, and I remember it was right around Christmas because his mom had just bought him, like, the first guitar that he had ever had. And um, and I remember going into his house, and he was sitting on his bed and holding the guitar, and it was a Gibson SG, like a, a wood tone, and he was just, like, playing it like, like Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he never took any lessons. He just kind of picked up the guitar and just started going crazy on it. I said, yeah, this this is going to work, you know? <laughs> You know, so, so yeah, we kind of got together and, you know, I had a drum set already, a little small drum set, and we went in the back of my mom's house. Uh, we had a room back there, and uh, we started practicing back there and jamming with different people and kind of put a little band together um, with one of the guys. The singer was in the high school with us, and I think the two other guys we just found, um, like, on a, a board at a local music shop, you know, like people put their names up mm -hmm. there and they were young. And uh, so we had us a little five-piece band called Ice, I-C-E, -E, Ice, and uh, had like an alien-looking creature, too, to it. It was pretty cool. And uh, we played the talent show at, at Plant High School in 1982. <laughs> kind of funny. So that happened, and, and, uh, and right after high school, I graduated, and Trey actually moved as well to the other side of town. So I didn't see him for about six months, and he started doing – he met a couple other people. And I stayed jamming with one of those, uh, with the bass player, and was doing some just, you know, Judas Priest and stuff like that back then. Um, and Trey was had met, that's when he met Dallas. Mm -hmm. and he met a singer, too, that um, they had this band called Death Watch. And the drummer was, like, from Lakeland, and, and he was, like, older. And, and they were like, yeah, we, you know, we got this other thing going now. It's kind of like what we had in high school. And, you know, he got a hold of me, and he was like, you know, you want to try jamming with us and I said sure so I came out there and it ended up just being me and Trey and Dallas and this singer and uh, it was called Death Watch and then the singer did something and he was kind of like uh, the singer for Cyber Thungle he had a sound like really strange voice like that <laughs> but anyway I don't know if you know Cyber Thungle but mm -hmm. if you do <laughs> he's got a very strange type of voice and that singer had that uh, that type of voice too actually and um, so we were jamming like that and everything was good and then the singer got caught like running drugs or something. I don't even remember because I didn't know he was even doing stuff like that back then. I didn't know him that well because they had, to, you know, I just kind of like joined in and we started getting really going with stuff. And uh, then that happened and we were like, oh no, what do we do now? So we started trying a bunch of singers out and that's when Dallas ended up singing, you know, for Morbid Angel. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we tried to several, maybe four or five different people and nobody just, I mean, they either didn't, have what we wanted and we kind of wanted at one point we even wanted somebody that could do even something like what King Diamond could do oh, you know because wow, yeah. we thought that would be cool too we used to do you know a, a lot of Merciful Fate cover stuff 
back then. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were doing covers in, in Morbid Angel, it was always like Angel Witch or or stuff like that, Merciful Fate. You know, some we even did some Judas Priest and stuff like that back then. And um, it, you know, Dallas ended up singing, and then we ended up getting a second guitar player, which was Richard Burnell. And I was the actually one that found him. I, there was um, this house on on this street by the water uh, called Bayshore, and there was this house where it was like a huge house, and these these guys owned it in a band, and and they just practiced in it, and they had these huge huge parties every weekend. So I used to go out there, and you know, like several bands would play in the front room of, of this house, and it, and and you know, it was crazy, you know, crazy old days. And that's where I met Richard, and I was like, hey, you know. We, we were really looking for a second guitar player, and he's like, yeah, man, I'll join. You know, he, we were starting to get popular in the kind of, you know, scene around Tampa. Right. And uh, so we didn't, you know, we'd never put anything out or anything by that at that point. But when we got Richard, we we were starting to do things, and we uh, recorded, oh, let's see, we recorded some live stuff and sent that out. Well, a guy that used to live in Tampa contacted me, and uh, he had moved from Tampa and he was a singer in Tampa, not not in any band that you would know or anything. Probably, I don't even remember if he had a band when he was living here. But he was from the Brandon area, and he had moved, and I didn't see him anymore. And all of a sudden, he called me one day, and he's, he's like, "I'm in North Carolina, and I'm in this band called Baron Cemetery." And he goes, uh, "The the the bass player of the band has has a whole bunch of money in a record label, and he's looking to sign a really good band, and he's got a lot of money to put in him." And I told him about Morbid Angel. <laughs> and I was like, really? That sounds pretty cool, you know? So we, I had Trey made up like a four song live tape for one of our shows, and we sent it to this guy, um, David Vincent. And he sent us a record contract back because he had a label called Goric Records. Mm-hmm. So we, we had the contract looked over, and it was a very simple, like four or five page contract. I still have a copy of it. And, mm-hmm. and we signed the contract, and we went up to North Carolina and recorded. The Abomination to Desolation album. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of cool because I know, uh, I'm, I'll always remember this more than almost recording the album was we were there and we had finished most of the recording and me and we had drove a, uh, a rider truck mm-hmm. up there from Tampa. We put all the equipment in a rider truck. We drove it up to North Carolina to the studio to record. And it was a country music studio. Uh-huh. And they had no clue what was just about to go down there, you know? <laughs> and uh, and actually, David Vincent, since he was the owner of the record label at that point, and not in the band, um, he hired um, um, Bill Matoyer, uh, who's mixed even Slayer, the first couple Slayer records, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Bill Matoyer's mixed everybody for, you can think of on Metal Blade, just about Lizzie Ford and all kinds of bands. I mean, he's, he's, I don't, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's one of the, the biggest engineers in the California area, mm-hmm. you know, for, uh, he's done several albums. So we got him. I mean, like I said, he worked on Slayer's album, you know, the first two, actually. So, um, yeah, we got Bill Matoyer to engineer the record. So we were, you know, working in the studio, and me and the bass player took, the uh, rider truck to a restaurant to go eat because I think Trey was doing his leads or something like that. So we went to, we were hungry, so we went to this little place and we're sitting there and we're eating, just me and the bass player, John Ortega, and he goes, he goes, don't look real fast, but look over there behind you to the right. He goes, that's the guitar player, Kirk Hammett from Metallica, and I don't know who the other guy is, but that's him. And I'm like, well, I did hear that they were playing in Charlotte that night with Ozzy. It was Metallica <laughs> opening up for Ozzy. And it was so funny. It was like, we got up to pay the bill, and he was like, let me go talk to him. I was like, no, don't mess with the dude, you know? <laughs> this is when Metallica was just starting to get popular, oh, right, you know? Right. And, and, you know, they were opening for Ozzy. And, and it was like, so we get in line to pay the bill, and Kurt Hammett <laughs> comes right behind us in line, and, and you know, he's standing in line, Behind us, and it happened. The other guy happened to be his guitar roadie, but so Johnny turns around. He's like, "Are you Kurt Hammett?" And he's like, "Um, yeah." And he kind of gave us that look, like, "Please don't, you know, like, don't freak out right here in front of everybody and let everybody know." And Johnny's like, "Oh, that's cool." He goes, "You know, we're in town recording an album," and then he kind of looked different at that point. He was like, "Really?" He goes, "Oh, that's pretty cool." (laughs) And so we start talking to him, and it turns. 
turns out him and his guitar roadie had left the hotel, and they walked like two miles to try to find this comic book shop, <laughs> which was across the street from the restaurant. So when they found the comic book shop, they walked back to Nate in the restaurant. So we actually gave Kurt Hammett and his guitar roadie a ride back to the hotel. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, in this big rider truck. So they're sitting in the back. They don't even know us. We could have killed them. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? They didn't know who we were. They just hopped in this big rider truck with us with no windows. You know, I mean, that's a guitar player from Metallica. It was pretty funny, though. But he was really nice. And we, we got back to the hotel, dropped them off, and he said, how many of y'all are in the studio? And we're like, well, there's, you know, four of us in the band and, you know, three other guys. So he goes, I'll, I'll put ten people on the guest list for you. One, you know, your name plus nine. And it was like, what? You know? <laughs> and so we get, went back to the studio and we're like, dude, we just met Kurt Hammond. He just put all of us on the guest list. <laughs> so that night we actually went and uh, saw Metallica and Ozzy play. Uh, and I remember Trey was like bored out of his mind because he didn't like Jakey Lee. <laughs> but it was quite funny. It was really crazy that, that, cool. that happened. As it, as it, I know we got off track there, but it was a, a weird story. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> but it was pretty cool, you know. And he did. He put us all on the guest list, man. Like just like that. It was like wow, you know, <laughs> ten people. Wow, you know. So that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> Especially if they were they were playing an arena. Yeah, you know, no this shit. is no small show. Yeah, yeah. So, it was huge, you know, and we invited him, of course, you know, told him to come to the studio if he ever wanted and gave the address, told him we'd be there, you know, for a couple more days, but we never heard anything, of course, right, but right, right. it would have been kind of funny if they'd show, showed up or something and threw a lead on there. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> it could happen, you never know. You know? But um, it was kind of cool, you know, I just remembered that out of a lot of things, <laughs> you know, and um, but anyway, we recorded the record, and, and then I remember that they sent that David Vincent set all of us back, except for Trey, to do the mix down. And I thought that was kind of uncool because I really wanted to be there for the mix down because I was singing, you mm -hmm. know. I wanted certain effects on my voice, certain places and things like that. And, you know, he sent us back and said, nope, I can only afford to keep one person here. And I didn't know that there was an actual plan behind our backs to try to get Trey to join his band. Right. So the whole time, you know, he was harping on Trey, oh, we need a guitar player really bad. We need a guitar player. And Trey's like, well, you know, I'm doing this right now. Sorry, man, you know, can't help you. So I guess, uh, you know, then um, we finished the record and, you know, Trey came back and he just seemed so different when he came back, mm -hmm. you know? And that was the start of everything, you know, getting worse and worse and worse. And mm -hmm. Trey's like, he goes, well, I talked to David Vincent and David thinks that, you know, and he told, he told me and Richard this, and he said, you know, he said, uh, we need to fire John Ortega and get this other bass player. You know, David found a bass player for us, this guy named Sterling. He lives in Atlanta, and, you know, he's like an amazing bass player. And, you know, just get rid of this guy. And he said, you know, we'll, we'll redo the bass tracks with Sterling on them, and we'll hold off putting the album out. See, that was the whole reason why the album was taking so long uh, to come out, mm -hmm. is that we were changing bass players because of David Vincent didn't want us to keep the bass player we had. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was already the start. And there was, to me, there was no problem. I liked Johnny. He was a good guy, you know, and he was a, a weird, he was more of a guitar player than a bass player. So he did play the bass like a guitar. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that. But he was, he was, he was good. You know, he was, he was, I mean, you see the videos. Yeah, yeah. We play at Rocky Point Beach Resort and that other one, uh, inside at, uh, at like a place in Brandon, mm -hmm. you know, from 86, those two shows, um, you know, he, he, he had no problems playing the songs, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, so it was weird. So Trey, it was, you know, it, it, Morbid Angel was actually Trey's name that he came up with, mm -hmm. you know, so it's always been his band, you know, I never, ever once disputed that. Right. I mean, you know, I was in it from the beginning, even in high school, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I probably was the one that got him out of his bedroom playing on a stage. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he would have ever left his bedroom. He could have been the greatest guitar player in the world and still been in his bedroom. Right. You know, sometimes, you know, he, he the way he is, you know, he needed that push. And mm -hmm. I, I, I was had no problem giving that to him <laughs> to get him out there to play, you know, and, and, and it got him out on stage. Yeah. You know, I don't know if he would ever got himself out <laughs> without somebody pushing him. You know, he's, you know, everybody knows he's a pretty big recluse. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, that's just the way he, he's always been that way, you know. But, you know, he does like to be on stage, so that's at least he, he, he has his own way to handle that, you know. But anyway, back to that thing again, you know, we got, so this guy named, named Sterling came down, and he was in a band called Incubus and, and up in Atlanta, and not the one that put out a few albums right. or, or the commercial one. There was a, there was a metal Incubus, mm-hmm. a different one, that put out Serpent Temptation and a couple albums. He wasn't in that band. Uh, they were from a different part of New Orleans. They were from New Orleans, and he was from Atlanta. But Sterling told me that uh, once Incubus kind of split up, that these other guys knew him. He, they did know each other, too, and that they used the name after he did. Because I guess Incubus, Sterling's Incubus, broke up in 86. So I don't know how he, he had it for a couple of years, too. So I don't know what what really was the deal there, you know. But um, he joined Morbid Angel, and we did, like, one show, and we were teaching him that, and we were actually learning some of the Incubus songs that he had wrote, and we were going to play those in Morbid Angel. And there's even a rehearsal out there that uh, of us with, with Sterling, probably the only recording with him except for the Incubus one. Mm-hmm. And and we're even playing uh, Reanimator's Mutilations Incubus <laughs> song it, with Morbid Angel, you know, Trey and me and Richard doing it. It's pretty cool. But, um, you know, we had new songs going, and Trey's, like, talking to people on the tape. You can even hear him going, yeah, all our new stuff is going to be. And this is after we recorded the record, you know, because obviously Sterling's in the band now. Right. You know? And, uh, and you know, it's like he's talking up how good the album is and how much the new stuff is going to be even faster and better. And then, you know, like, everything was going fantastic, and Sterling was learning the songs. We were about about ready to let him re-record the bass tracks. And uh, one day I was at work, and I'm driving down in Trey's neighborhood and working, and and I said, oh, I'll stop by Trey's house for lunch, see what's going on, you know, because mm-hmm. I had to eat lunch, and I was like, oh, I'll just stop by there. Mm-hmm. So I stopped by there, and I see my girlfriend's car out in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, my God, don't tell me this is really going down, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, uh, what do I do? You know, I, I can't ignore this now. You know, I'm at work in my work uniform and everything. And I was just going to stop in and say, hey, to Trey, you know, see how things were going with the album and stuff. And there's my girlfriend's car. And I'm like, great. Now what do I do? So I walk up to the door. Instead of knocking on it, I put my ear to the door and all I could hear was a TV. I couldn't hear anything else. Mm-hmm. So I kind of stepped back and I kicked the door in and I broke the door off. off I broke the wood off the door and everything where the lock is when I kicked the door open. And, yeah, Trey was, like, all over on the couch. They were kissing each other. You know, they weren't doing anything other than that yet. But he was on top of her, and they were kissing right on the couch with the TV on. And that's the first thing I saw when I kicked the door in. Jesus. And, uh, you know, I got mad, and I, and I, and I, like, kicked her car, and I took off, you know. And uh, then that night, Trey actually quit the band he said uh, i called david vincent and i'm going to go up there and you know and i talked to richard and he's going to go with me and i'm like what you know over this <laughs> and he came to pick up his equipment because all of us lived in a house but him mm-hmm. and he was living with his mom and so he comes to get his equipment that night and i just beat his ass i mean like really bad <laughs> i tore him up really bad <laughs> throwing him against the walls and everything and richard went in his room and locked the door <laughs> and, and and yeah and, and sterling was like laughing at him and pointing at him and laughing at him and you know i was just throwing him up against the walls and, you know i got even twice as mad that he was going to quit the band over it you know like break up a whole thing that we had an album coming out and everything you know mm-hmm. i was like you do this to me and then you're going to quit the band after that, you know, too. And, and, you know, so, and Sterling was just like, you know, after I, that happened, he took his equipment and left. And Richard was like, he left real quick. He wouldn't talk to me anymore. Cause he, you know, cause he should have stayed with me and Sterling. That would have been awesome too. Mm-hmm. You know, that could have worked quite, quite well, but he decided to go with Trey instead. Cause that's where all the money was. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, we got a contract still. We got this. We got all this money with this guy and blah, blah, blah. You know, and it's like, okay, go ahead. You know, whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. It's not my band, you know. So Mm -hmm. Sterling said, don't worry about it, man. We got Incubus. I was like, well, you're right, you know. Mm -hmm. So we actually tried um, Steve Shoemaker Mm -hmm. out on guitar. You know him? 
yeah, of course I know him. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but he actually um, was, uh, uh, the funny thing is, you know, he knew Sterling mm-hmm. from the, being in the area, and he had also was the guitar player in David Vincent's band that they had got rid of when they were looking for a guitar oh, player interesting. And, got, and went to try <laughs> So he came down from Atlanta and tried out for us, and we were thinking about using him. And then I said, well, I know this other guy named Gino. And Gino came over and just kind of blew his, you know, blew blew him away with what he wanted to do. You know, he was, like, talking them all up. Oh, yeah, we'll do this and that. And, you know, that's the way Gino was. And so Sterling picked Gino over Steve. So, unfortunately, it, it you know, it, it wouldn't have been what it was. Anyway, you know, mm-hmm. with somebody else, another guitar player, and I know that, you know, but we, uh, we, the band only lasted like six months. <laughs> right. So that was the thing. Incubus only lasted six months, and, 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 and it was like Sterling and Gino drank all the time. Mm-hmm. Either one of them worked, and Sterling's family was very rich and just used to send him money, and Gino's parents, he still lived at home, you know? Mm-hmm. So. I was the only one that worked in any of these bands, it seems like. <laughs> but uh, it's funny. But and I'm still working. But anyway, um, yeah, so that happened, and we got together for about six months and recorded a demo and, and uh, never got a chance to play a live show. And I went to work one day, and I came home from work, and Sterling's crying, actually, like crying, going, man, the band's done, the band's done. He goes, me and Gino went to the beach today and got drunk, and these girls came up, and we got into an argument in front of the girls, and he punched me, and I fell down, and he ran off, and the band's over, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm like, you know, and, and I talked to Gino on the phone. He's like, yeah, I'm done, man. Forget this. And I'm like, you know what? No, I'm done, you know? And I'm like, I'm out of here, too. I'm done with all of this, you know? And, and that's when I just said, I'm going to do my own band with my own name, and that's it. And that's when I decided to come up with Nocturnus. Uh-huh. And I got with Richard Bateman, uh, as he was the first person. It was just bass and drums. Mm-hmm. And we wrote BCAD with just bass and drums. Wow. And, and then, yeah, and then we got uh, Vincent Crowley was actually the first guitar player oh, in, cool. in Nocturnus. A lot of people don't really realize that either. <laughs> they think it was either Gino or D- in Davis, but it was actually... Um, Davis was actually the third guitar player oh, cool. <laughs> in Nocturnus. Uh-huh. Uh, Gino was Gino was the second guitar player, but Vincent Crowley was the first guitar player. <laughs> and and uh, and yeah, we got Vince, and then we got Gino came back into the picture with me, and and because uh, actually Gino knew Richard Bateman very well too. They went to high school together, so it was when I was you know started jamming with Richard, then he knew about that, and he wasn't doing anything, you know, and it, so he came back in the situation too. And then we ended up recording that one demo, and and uh, Vince was just like he hated living in Florida. He does not like heat. <laughs> he, <laughs> so he's like, you know, uh, he was kind of fed up with a lot of stuff that was going on with him, and he's just like, you know, this is not. And well, what really happened was Richard first. Richard uh, Nasty Savage had lost their bass player because he put his hand through a plate glass window and messed up a whole bunch of tendon Ugh. in his fingers, and he couldn't. He could in his arm. Mm-hmm. He couldn't play bass, so they needed they were, they had tour scheduling and all kinds of stuff, and they needed like a replacement guy like really fast. They were actually on tour when it happened, and so they they knew Bateman, and so they asked Bateman if he would do it, and he he said he would do it. You know, mm-hmm. so that kind of like was like, oh, now what are we gonna do? You know, and then Vince kind of got fed up with the whole situation at that point too, and left. So I was stuck with Gino again, just me and Gino again. <laughs> And then uh, Gino's like, well, I got a cousin that plays guitar. You know, he's like, he's he's really good, but he's taking a lot of lessons. And he's he's like, you know, that kind of good. And he goes, I can you know, teach him a bunch of stuff, too, you know, because, you know, we know each other and we're family, you know. And so we got Mike Davis in the band that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and that's how we got Jeff in the band as well, because they were friends. They all went to school together, uh-huh. all these guys. So that that was how we got the uh, the lineup that, that that ended up being you know on the second Nocturnus demo and basically on the album too the key mm-hmm. you know it kind of rounded up, rounded about and we did the second demo with Gino and then Gino went to jail and so he was replaced by Mike's neighbor uh, this guy lived like three houses down from Mike and they used to jam guitar. 
guitar together, so they were like knew each other's playing very well. So he's like, you know, he joined the band, Sean, and that was how the first. Uh, and then uh, those guys all knew a keyboard player because I wanted to have some intros for the demo. Right. The, the second demo, and I was like, I want to have like two intros for the demo of some wind and this and that, you know. And they're like, oh, we know a guy has got this little sampling keyboard, and he can make up some stuff for us. And I'm like, cool. So he made up some stuff and brought his keyboard over to the warehouse and plugged it into a PA, and he played the intro, and we listened to it. We're like, wow, that's pretty cool, you know. So we're like, play that again, and we'll start the song. So he played it, and, and we started playing right after he played it, you know, live, like mm-hmm. in the warehouse there. And uh, while we were playing the song, he started playing along with us, and it was like, wow, that sounded really cool. You know, then we were like, before we knew it, we were working on the first song, putting keyboards in it. <laughs> And and that's how Nocturnus ended up with keyboards, you know. It was mm-hmm. pretty, and then you know, that's that's uh that's pretty much the whole story of how all that happened. <laughs> so so you guys right officially changed the name of the band like what was it right after you played it um, Maryland Death Fest or something like that. So so tell right us right before actually. Okay, it was somewhere around there. I'm old. I forget a little bit. So what? So, so... <laughs> wait, uh, wait, you're talking to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> So, Mike, who is who is in the band now? Which wait, wait, Nocturne is AD. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, besides myself on on, on drums and vocals, uh, Damien Heftel is on guitar, and um, he he's been playing with me since two thousand and six, I believe. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. We've had a, yeah, we've we've been doing After Death since two thousand and six. Right. And uh, and I I did a, a another band with, with some friends of mine that do quite classic metal stuff. Like uh, they're just they've always been a cover band, but had a few originals kind of thing. And they got back together and needed a drummer, so I, I was jamming with this band called Argus for a little while. Mm-hmm. And funny thing is, when I was in Morbid Angel, I used to go watch them. Ah. They were like the big like touring band that toured, you know, like the the bar circuit and played bar songs all night you know they played like three long sets but they were doing stuff like angel witch and the old iron maiden off the first two records and and old black sabbath and things like that you know they were the only band on the touring circuit that wasn't doing rock you know they were doing metal Mm -hmm. and so i was watching them you know when i was in morbid angel so when (laughs) later on when these guys were like yeah our, our drummer's the only one that doesn't live in tampa anymore so i started jamming with them for a on the side, you know, while I was in After Death. Right. And uh, and then one of the guitar players had some hip problems, and he had, had to leave the band for a little while. Those guys are, are older than I'm 55, and those guys are, like, I think three years older than me, or four. So they're, like, 58, 59. And, um, you know, so it was like they asked me if I wanted to play drums for them, so I was doing that. And then when their other guitar player left, I got Damien and, and, and Argus as well. So we were doing that for a little while, and then uh, the singer was having a bunch of problems, and uh, so it just kind of didn't go very far. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody was getting older in and, and that band, and that, they, they still have a new, they got another drummer and um, singer, mm-hmm. and now they're doing it again. That one guitar player came back, so they have the original three, two guitar players and bass player, but the singer is new, and uh, and really, that was like, one of the main things I liked jamming with Arcus was their singer was just amazing. Mm-hmm. He had a killer, killer voice. He could do Jesus Priest. <laughs> he could do, you know, um, you know, yeah, he could do Jesus Priest, no problem. But he didn't have that kind of like Dio kind of voice. He had the Judas Priest Ozzy kind of voice. Oh, really. yeah, yeah. It was weird. But he had a great singing voice. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun playing that stuff. He could do all that stuff. Even ACDC, he could do that type of voice, you know. He had a great voice. It was fun doing those kind of songs, you know, for something else. Mm-hmm. And uh, but then uh, so that it's been me and Damien for a while, and then um, we got Belial Koblack. He's the other guitar player. We got him in After Death. I want to say probably about two thousand and eight. Mm-hmm. And he, we had another guitar player, and he couldn't do the tour, so we got the Belial learned the songs in like a month and went on tour with us. And it was like after we got back, it's like okay, you're in the band. You know, <laughs> so that worked out pretty good. And yeah, and, you know, we changed a few different bass players. And right now we have Daniel Tucker, mm-hmm. who was on the first obituary record, Slowly We Rot. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, he's playing bass for us, and he's been in the band, I think, oh, probably almost 10 years now, 
wow. since about 2009 or 10. Mm-hmm. I would say 2010, I think he joined. And um, now we ha- and now we have a new keyboard player that joined about a year and a half ago, uh, Josh Holdren. Mm-hmm. And and uh, he's he's really talented. He can play drums. He's a grindcore type drummer. Right. So he's really fast. Plus he's got some jazz background background. So he, he's a really good drummer. He's a he's a guitar player and he plays keyboards. Wow. So yeah, we we met him and he, he's a little younger than us, but not a lot. He's in his thir- mid thirties, so mm-hmm. that's not too bad. You know, we didn't want to get like a kid in the band, like eighteen, nineteen year old kid. You know, that just would have been too much of a difference, I think. Mm-hmm. But Josh fits in good. He's younger than us, but you know, he's like he's he acts like a kid, which is cool. You know, he's and he's uh he's just a very good person, and and uh you know he's he he has a very big interest in the occult. And, and what's funny is when I met him at the at the Brass Mug in Tampa, when we didn't need a keyboard player, I talked to him, and we we I think I talked to him twice, and we would always talk about occult stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, pretty, guy's pretty cool. And I knew him more as a drummer. I didn't really even realize that he played keyboards. A lot of people didn't know that. They knew him as a drummer around Tampa. Mm-hmm. And uh, But he's only been here a few years. I think he's lived here like three or four years now. Um, so he hasn't been here that long, really. But I, I barely knew him, but I kind of knew him as a, as like a more of a grindcore type drummer around Tampa. And, uh, and you know, so we were talking, and then somebody else said, hey, somebody was like, have you heard Josh play keyboards? And I'm like, no. Because they knew we were looking for a keyboard player, and we actually did one show without a keyboard player just because we hadn't found the right person, you know. Mm-hmm. And and uh, it, they said, yeah, have you ever, does this guy play? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you need to check this guy out. So we talked to him, and uh, you know, he gave me his number, and I talked to him, and he's like, yeah, I'd love to come out. And, and he came out, and he just clicked with us perfect, you know. He, I mean, being that he plays drums, he, he has a very good feel for drumming. Right. Yeah, and, and and that kind of keyboards that matches with some of the drums and stuff mm-hmm. instead of all the time the guitar. Right. Sometimes we have the keyboards matching with the drums. Sometimes they match with the guitar. Sometimes they're making weird sounds. But he kind of understands all those different things, you know. He's got a very open mind for doing stuff like that. And and um, one thing I've always wanted is, is a keyboard player that could just rip out like a keyboard lead, like like, say, Deep Purple or Emerson, right. like a yeah, proper yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. keyboard lead. <laughs> and no keyboard player that we've ever had was able to just rip out a lead like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And we were playing this one song, and, and when we were writing these songs for this album, and, and we, they were going back and forth with leads, I said, you know, since there's six, why don't we do guitar, guitar, keyboard lead, guitar, guitar, keyboard lead? And I was like, hmm, you know, and... Josh is like, yeah, I've never tried that before. And I was like, well, just think like a real fast solo on a guitar, you know, scale type of thing, and do that on the keyboards. And he's like, okay. You know, so we worked on it a couple times, and he just ripped out a pretty good lead right away. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is exactly what we, what we wanted. So we had like three or four keyboard leads on the album, oh, on this yep, album, yep. that we never had, even in Nocturnus before. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a couple little things here and there, but, you know, but never like a full lead part right and it sounds kind of yeah it's gonna say it sounds kind of cool too and now mike with nocturnus ad now is this your first full-length album as nocturnus ad yes it actually is yeah. that seems so weird <laughs> it's like your debut I know, it's, album it's to think of it that way <laughs> i mean I, I i i don't know what uh, what i think of it either because you know we, most of the you know uh, four of the five of us have been playing in after death for several years right recordings but we did those recordings in, in in D tuning which is lower all the nocturna stuff was in E flat so when we played live we used to play some nocturna songs but they would always sound a little different because they weren't in the right tuning right but nobody wanted you know we didn't want to bring like two sets of guitars sure, just to sure. and keep changing guitars during the set because we go back and forth we don't play like five nocturna songs and then five other songs you know we go back and forth and back and forth and two and three and yeah, I, I think every time we play, we usually do a different set. So, you know, we like like changing things up and playing different songs. And, um, you know, the, with this, it, 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 it gave us the ability to do even more, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
So it's just, it was just weird for me, this, your debut album. <laughs> but anyways, Mike, your debut album <laughs> is a paradox. So tell us a little bit about the album now, the, you know, the, the concept behind it and all that kind of thing. Well, back when I was doing the key, um, a lot of people consider it like the key a whole concept album, but mm -hmm. really it's just the last four songs is the actual key story. All right. Andromeda Strain, the uh, Droid Sector, Destroying the Manger and Empire of the Sands. That's mm -hmm. the actual key story. And like Lake of Fire and Standing in Blood were another little story that kind of went together too. But all the other songs were kind of all by themselves on the key. And that's how kind of, that's how the album was set up. But the way it, it was set up, people thought that the whole thing was like a concept because it actually you can kind of look at it that way. But really the key story is just those four songs. Mm -hmm. And what happened was we, we faded out Empire of the Sands back then because on the second record, I wanted to fade back in with that same rhythm and start the story back of what was going on. You know, we obviously had a story going with it ended with Empire of the Sands and, and on thresholds, it just completely disappears. In fact, nothing on thresholds connects back to the key at all. Hmm. Nothing. You know, no concept, nothing. Mm -hmm. None of the songs connect back at all. And that's not what I wanted to do at all. So now, you know, this is, I know it's been a lot longer, but I started seeing so many bands were, were being successful and getting away with doing like Entombed AD, Venom Inc. You know, sure, sure. They're, they're, you know they're not getting sued. You right. know, so I said, you know, I think the stars finally aligned for me <laughs> and, and just told me to do this, you know, and, and do it and, and no other shall say nay <laughs> from the book of the law. Uh -huh. So anyway, and uh, yes, and, and so I did what I wanted. I did my will and I, and I, and I started the band back and I said, I'm going to do this and nobody's going to stop me this time. Mm -hmm. And, and I did it and well, the album's out. <laughs> You know, we what I did on, on on the album was I continued the key story with mm -hmm. four songs again, and then we added an outro song to it uh, that was an instrumental. So that really, you know, but the key story continuance of it is four more songs on the album, uh, Paradox. Mm -hmm. And then also there's a song, Seizing the Throne, that connects with Lake of Fire and Standing in Blood and kind of completes that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it doesn't really complete it. It, could, it can keep going. That could be another continuing story on the next record as well as four more songs from the key story, which I will do on the, on the next record. And, and we have Neolithic, uh, and we have a song called Paleolithic, which is the next step in history. Mm -hmm. So um, I could probably do another, like, uh, another one after that. Probably. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not, but I probably will continue the um, Lake of Fire Standing in Blood thing. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and seizing the throne, and now then there'll be a, a fourth song to complete, probably complete that story, or I could keep it going. Uh, it, you never know. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I never know. We'll have to wait uh, and see. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, but that's you know that's um, yeah. I'll have to wait and see what I do too. I, I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know what I'm doing from one day to the next anymore. <laughs> did you, who did the cover art for that? Oh, uh, a guy named Timbu Kayano. Mm-hmm. He, he's um. He, he's, I saw, uh, he did a t-shirt for us. Um, uh, this guy uh, asked us if we wanted to do a one-off t-shirt for Destroying the Manger theme, you know, like a Destroying the Manger type shirt. I said, that sounds pretty cool. And the guy said, well, you know, we'll do like 100 shirts and, you know, we'll give you like 10. And, you know, that's how you usually, 10 or 15, 20, something like that. And that's how we usually work these small shirt deals. And it's a limited edition of 100. So I said, okay, cool. And he's like, uh, I got an artist that's really, really good, and he's done some album covers and stuff. So I'll hook you up with him, and you can tell him what you, what kind of idea you have for destroying the major, you know, for the shirt. And I said, okay, cool. So we did that, and he did some really good art. And I was like, man, did you? How did you do that so quick? He was really fast. Mm -hmm. Then he told me it wasn't digital either; it was a painting, an oh, actual wow. hand painting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. So I kind of kept him in mind, you know, mm -hmm. so when the album time came around, I asked him if he wanted to do it because he did a really good version of, of, of our character and changed him a little bit again, even from the Dan Seagrave one and even from the one before that. That was the original key cover that never got used. <laughs> so I've had this guy, you know, this mascot for years, like, you know, since like 1990, 89, actually. I kind of came up 
up with the idea. Mm -hmm. So I've been using him off and on, you know, for that stuff. But like with thresholds, he disappeared, of course. <laughs> so I didn't hardly write anything, and then now I'm bringing him back. So and now I actually gave him a name, Doctor Alan William Magus. Ah. So he's doc, Dr. Magus. Yeah, he's got an actual name now. Well, I kept <laughs> calling him the key guy or, or the, <laughs> the key character or the, mas, you know, the band's mascot or whatever you want to call him. I didn't know. I, I, or the, he's an android. Okay. You know, he's all these things, but who is he? He was obviously a scientist, you know, in, in on the key. Mm -hmm. So he had to have a name. So his name popped into my head and I'm like, sounds awesome. Dr. Magus. There you go. Yeah. So it, it worked out perfect, you know, and, and the whole name just came into my head, and I was like, oh, cool, I like it. So I decided to give him a name, kind of like how Eddie from Iron Maiden, yeah. Eddie, yeah. you know, so, so we have our Dr. Magus. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so the, yeah, the album continues with that story, and like I said, I'll even continue that on the next album. So, and uh, more of the key story, and it can go... Pretty far, we faded out the album again, just like we did with Empire of the Sands. So now we can fade back in the next record, just like we faded out Paradox. So, Mike, where was this recorded? This was recorded in Orlando um, at, at New Constellation Studios uh, by Jarrett Pritchard. He's, uh, Jarrett used to live in Tampa a long time ago, and uh, we actually lived in the same apartment building uh -huh. at one point. And he was in this band called Eulogy back then, and they were they were they were an awesome like death metal band. I mean, really good, fast, technical back then stuff. You know, kind of one of the a little bit ahead of their time kind of type bands. And they didn't last a real long time, but they put out a few a few releases. And so that's how I knew Jared. You know, and then he moved to Orlando at one point and started working for uh, like uh, Full Sail and places like that, where he was actually teaching. Uh, audio and video okay. classes and stuff like that. So he started learning that, and then he started hooking up with bands again. And he started hooking up with really big bands, and you know, then he started recording albums. And you know, it's just like this friend of mine that you know we used to just sit around in an apartment, hanging out, talking <laughs> about you know music and stuff. And and here he is, like touring all over the world, you know, running sound for you know thirteen forty nine and that's cool, no yeah. horror and all these really big bands, you know. And I'm like, wow.
he definitely made that record what it was. I mean, a lot of people were complimenting on, on the sound that we got, you mm -hmm. know, and mm -hmm. that's not us, that's him. Mm -hmm. you know, the sound that you're hearing, well, he definitely knew how to get the shaping of getting the keyboards being able to be heard all the time with the guitar players still being heard all the time, you know, and nobody suffering. It takes a lot when you have keyboards that fill up oh, so yeah. much space. Yep. And, you know, a lot of people, when they do use keyboards, they, they, they do one thing. You know, sometimes our keyboards do a bunch of things. Right. Sometimes they do one thing, but they fill up a lot of space usually in all the sounds, you know, and so with all that space being filled up of equalization, you have to cut out room for every instrument, you know, so it has its place so you can hear it. So, uh, you know, he, he did a lot of work on, on, on getting that sound the way it, it sounds, the way it's like a little bit raw, but still mm -hmm. clean, yeah, you know, it, yeah, it where you can hear everything. Right, and it did come out fantastic. And and so, Mike, what do you guys got coming up now for, for the rest of the year? I mean, this is going to air Tuesday, so I know this weekend you have something, but what do you guys got coming up for this year? Well, right now we have, uh, we're have we playing in, in Santiago, Chile, at the uh, Santiago Metal Fest this weekend coming mm -hmm. up. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then two weeks after that, two weekends after that, we're playing the Destroying Texas Fest in Houston. And then we're going to write some new songs for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to do, it's not totally announced, but we might do something in December in, in, in Atlanta, mm -hmm. possibly. Uh, we're working on that. And mm -hmm. then... We're talking about next summer for sure, going back to Europe and doing some festivals. Nice, nice. And if people want to learn more about the band, where's the best sites to go to, Mike? Well, uh, pretty much our Facebook page, and now um, Damien started us an Instagram page. Because, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I run pretty much my page and the Facebook page. And with a with a job and my daughter and everything, oh, yeah. it keeps me super busy. <laughs> so I was like, you know, everybody's like, you guys need an Instagram page. You need an Instagram page. Everybody's telling us that, and I don't know the first thing about Instagram. <laughs> I I don't have an Instagram page, and but everybody's saying, even the label is like, dude, our Instagram page does better than our Facebook page. So I was like, you know, so I you know I know Damien had an Instagram page, so I said, dude, please. <laughs> I can't do anymore. I'm like stacked up to my 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 top of my head with stuff to do every day, and I, I can't add another thing in anymore. You know, like that stuff right. that big. Right. You know, and I think you know. Can you handle that? He's like, sure. So, you know, uh, we do have an Instagram page and we do have a Facebook page. All right. So there you guys go. Nocturnus AD have a new album out on Profound Lore Records called Paradox. <laughs> their debut album as Nocturnus AD. And you can learn more about the band on their Instagram and their Facebook page. And Mike, as always, thank you for taking the time to come on the show, telling us about Nocturnus and telling us about all those cool freaking morbid angel stories that probably nobody in this whole world knows. Wow, there's so many. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. Of, I mean, for the amount of time I was in the band, I wasn't, I mean, a lot of people don't realize it, but that's, you know, over a span of over four years that I jammed with Trey. Right. So right. we we did write a lot of stuff together, <laughs> and, it, it, and most of it ended up on their albums. Mm-hmm. You know, over a span of several albums, too. It wasn't like, you know, the, I started hearing stuff that I wrote with Trey in 1985. Yeah, that's... You know, in, in the 2000s, you know, mm. <laughs> on a more of an angel record, I'm like, whoa, mm -hmm. there's that riff we used to play, yep. you know, okay. and, and this song, but now it's called this, you know, <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah. wow, that's a so little... it was kind of funny, but, you know, he, I think he pretty much used almost every single thing <laughs> from, from the, that, back that time, he, he reused it one way or another, and they made royalties off of it, I didn't, but, you mm -hmm. know, at least I was on it, and, and, and there's records of that, and, you know, recordings of it, and it's it really did happen. <laughs> now we all know the story, Mike. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show, and have a great time on your little show that you're doing this week. And I don't say a little. You guys are going to go, where is it? Chile. You guys are going to Chile, so you're going to be... Pretty busy there. Hopefully, no volcanoes erupt or anything while you're there. And uh... <laughs> uh, I know they've been having some crazy weather over there. Actually, oh my yeah, gosh. Had, they had some tornadoes in the south of Chile that they never had before. Oh, oh gosh! This guy was the promoter was telling me. Well, hopefully that's all said and done. And, and Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, great talking to you as always, and we'll always talk.